folks, welcome. I'm Julie Brown, Assistant Professor of Gerontology. Um, just a real quick comment, if you have a cell phone with you, please make sure that it's turned to silent or vibrate. I appreciate it. And this is the fifth presentation uh, for Wealth and Poverty Week, Identities and Inequalities. I'd like to uh, express uh, gratitude for those who have sponsored this, uh, the Appalachian Rural Health Institute, the Department of Social and Public Health, Child and Family Studies, the College of Health Sciences and Professions, and the Wealth and Poverty theme. All right, so to introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Watkins is a professor and director of graduate studies in the Graduate Center for Gerontology at the University of Kentucky. Trained as a mathematical demographer, but armed with ethnographic skills associated with life history narratives, he applies his craft in studies of the demographic processes of population aging and the aged, population growth and redistributional impacts, and life course influences on later life, health behaviors, and notions of home. John is past president of the Population Specialty Group and Aging Specialty Group of the Association of American Geographers, served on the Senior Advisory Panel of the National Science Foundation, and is a fellow of the Association for Gerontology and Higher Education. Although he is a highly regarded and respected gerontologist, I dare say that such recognition is a distant second to his primary passion, teaching, which has resulted in numerous departmental, college, university, and national awards for his attempts at teaching and advising. I can attest to this as he was one of the two primary forces that shaped my own doctoral career for the better. So for those of you who are uh, here who are my students, you have in a sense have been indirectly benefited from his teaching too. So with that, I'm extremely proud and delighted that John can be with us today. So please give him a warm, oh you, oh yeah, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, I would normally, the first thing out of my mouth, say welcome to GRN 250 section 002. I'm still your host, John Watkins. And it would be Tuesday or Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. And there would be 175 of you, freshmen and sophomores. But you were not them. So instead I'll say thank you very sincerely uh, to all of you for being here today and also for this institution. Uh, for inviting me to be here in part of this series. Uh, it is an honor. It really is an honor. In preparation for this, just as background, uh, at very first I wasn't exactly sure who the audience would be. So I immediately defaulted to a mid to higher level scholarly audience of professionals, researchers, scholars in the field of welfare, poverty, identity, uh, and then the word started getting back to me that, well, actually there might be a few students. And then continued words got back to me. So let me see a show of hands, please. How many are students? Okay, almost half. <laughs> yeah, you would get that joke. I think Julie might have said, my training and my doctorate basically is in mathematics and mathematical demography. So yeah, yeah about half are students. So based on that anticipation too, I've remodified, if you will, if you can even say that word, the way I'm going to cast this. I don't mean to insult anybody, but I'm going to provide some very basic background and very slowly ramp it up to some very compelling questions that really are at the center of society today and I would argue in the future, certainly the near future for reasons that will become quite apparent. So let's start out with this. Now, I'm a gerontologist, I'm in the Graduate Center for Gerontology, all right, and a demographer. So we'll look at this and we know this. The bars are demonstrating that the number of older people in millions is growing fairly dramatically, especially in the recent years. And we know why the baby boom is aging now, really moving into the 65 and plus age group starting in 2011. So now the game begins as of 2011. The red line is showing the percentage of people 65 in the total population, so it's the share. And we can see this also increasing pretty regularly, slowing down a little bit, really anticipated to increase into the future. Part of our background here, part of our background, we all know this. This is used to justify so much gerontological research, it's almost embarrassing. 
And I'll come back to that in a little bit too. I would like you to imagine what this line might look like if something was different. We'll move to this slide. Step through some quick history, left to right. The changing balance of our population for those who are under the age of five to those who are age 65 and over, all right? I also have life expectancy at birth, at birth, that's listed. Starting at 1860, let's move up to the turn into the 20th century, where 48.3 years is what a newborn child could expect to live statistically in the United States. And this was a pretty dramatic increase over the 30 years that pretty much represented human history from the dawn of existence all the way up through the early 1800s. So there's already some advances, obviously, in health to move it all the way up to 48 years at birth. 4% of the population age 65 and above. The dominant element in the population are small people. And that's an indication right there, 12%, 12 percent, 12 percent of the entire population under the age of five. And we'll step forward kind of quickly, 1950. And we can start to see a shifting balance between that first five-year age group, those under the age of five and those over the age of 65. Also a very dramatic increase in life expectancy. Quick review, what really is happening right in here, all right? Two things that are remarkable. First, antibiotics. It's as simple as that. It was a big advancement in health discoveries, I would argue, based on germ theory. Now we can actually do something to battle germs. They were introduced to our soldiers in World War II and just following World War II became more widespread to the general public. So this is in the mid to late 40s really that antibiotics, simple antibiotics came into being in general use. They made a tremendous impact on what had been number one, two, and three killers probably or a cause of death in the United States. Infection, infection related something else, and infection related something else, basically. Controlling infection, absolutely, absolutely critical. So that made a big difference in advancing our life expectancy. We started seeing some big increases here because in 1946, contrary to what all the experts thought would happen, people started making a lot of babies and more babies, and more babies. And by 1956, it had been one of the highest fertility rates ever recorded. So this is the baby boom that was happening, totally unexpected. And that was really changing the pace of aging in the United States. What it was doing though, if you think about it, was slowing it down. People are living longer, but at the same time, there's all these babies that are being born to make the population younger. So on balance, yes, we were aging, but imagine going back to that first graph, if we had not seen the baby boom, how old our population would be today? How old the population would be today? That's a question for you to think about. It would be remarkable, truly remarkable. And I think I might do some calculations with that when I get back. By 1970, the trend continues. I highlight this particular date, besides the fact that some of the best music was coming out right around 1970. The fact that we now see an imbalance of older people over that first five-year age group for the first time ever in human existence. It's kind of the emergence of an older population, almost as a force to be reckoned with. And one in 10 people. They're becoming more visible in our population too. We're more likely to just randomly bump into them when we have a share of a population that's one in 10. All right. Story continues and you can just read these numbers. Today it's about 14. It's estimated about 14.4, but again, that's an estimate as of this year. 
this percentage continues to fall, life expectancy still creeping up a little bit. I will come back to this too because we can argue this one of two ways. Medical technology, we've already seen what is done with antibiotics, imaging technologies, advanced surgical techniques, pretty remarkable advances, suggesting that we could continue to extend our life expectancy. But I'll argue near the end that there's so many things that are happening now because of medical technology that it's actually making our essential health worse. So we could very well start experiencing a decline in life expectancy at birth and pretty much across all ages too. I'll kind of be hinging some of my arguments on that as we continue. So, age structure. For the student folks in here, basic population pyramid, it's a bar graph. Lowest ages, five-year age groups at the bottom, oldest ages up here to age 100 and above. Males on the left, females on the right, and this essentially shows the age structure of a population. I've gone starting at least all the way up to 1990. There's our baby boom. Just that big hump in the age structure. And this caused a lot of social issues during the time, and I think many people are aware of that. I mean, huge, huge waiting lines in maternity wards. Big populations in K through 12 education as these people move through their schooling where they had to build new schools, Quonset huts, class sizes 45, 50 in second, third, fourth grade. I was experiencing that. Then they went into the labor force. Unemployment goes up because of the demand for jobs. And on and on. Well, these are the people now. Oh, I just circled that. Ah, oh, they started making babies. But they weren't making as many babies per woman, per woman. So they weren't as fertile, if you will, as their parents were, all right? Actually, their parents are up here. But the baby boomers, as parents, they weren't making as many per woman. But still, when you have all these people making babies, we get a lot of kids being born, all right? So there's 1990. Move that up to the year 2000. Aging of the baby boom. 2000, the peak age, 40 to 44, right? We just see this moving right up here. And now they're kids continuing to age. The other thing, too, for the students in here, starting at age 40 and 45, right about here, we start seeing a gender imbalance with more women than men in every single age group for the United States population. And the imbalance increases as we move through later ages. There are just more women than the men. Population pyramid, all right? Projected 2025, a squaring of the population pyramid. Fertility rates declining slowly, but fairly stable at a low level. Aging of the baby boom, now into their retirement, post-retirement years. That's an aging population. That's the time dynamic and the force of fertility. And I mention that part because in gerontology, the focus is on older people. And I put that in flying quotes, I have to. Where if you move into it, it's because I have a grandmother and I really liked her. So I really love gerontology. Well, looking at it holistically, one of the more important factors that controls population aging is baby making. We, as individuals, will always get older, and we can very effectively predict the aging of an individual chronologically. Every person in here, one year from today, will be exactly one year older. We know that. But if we look at the aging of a population, it's based on the age structure, this age structure. And if all these people started making babies like the baby boom parents, our population will start getting younger for a while. Does this make sense? Okay. So that's the power of that. 
And just to give you a clue of how I teach in a gerontology class, and I'm doing this on Tuesday, by the way, the day before Thanksgiving Day, that's when I start my baby-making lecture. So it's on primary determinants of fertility, biologically, technologically, behaviorally, socially, all those things that factor the ability to make babies, and then how many babies are actually born through decisions to do that too. And it's an aging class. People look at me kind of strange when I focus so much on fertility and young people. That's saying something about my approach. And I'm almost done talking about old people too, by the way. All right. So aging happens. It always has, always will. This is aging of individuals. This is a basic premise, right? It will always happen. Also, more age brings more diversity. Many people have suggested that, and diversity in so many ways. When we've been around so long, we naturally will accumulate more and more experiences. And in my mind, my way of thinking, it's not the experiences that are so important, it's our memories of the experience, because we can reshape memories, and how we use those memories in our own decisions. We don't use experiences in decisions, we use memories of experiences in decisions. Which is starting to suggest we really ought to take some psychological views of what is happening in aging. All right? That's where diversity comes in. And people go on their own paths. Now, basic lifespan. People are born, they age, and they die. <laughs> that's lifespan. And that's pretty simple. And they accumulate experiences along the way. This is my own individual lifespan, for better or for worse. The only difference, I expect to be cremated. Now, we also need to consider context in here, because we don't live in isolation. And this context adds a lot to the whole story of what is happening between birth and death. Now I want to point out too that there are arrows coming from farther to the left, say before birth. And also point out that there are arrows that are heading beyond death. Time is very important in our life course. And looking at that, can anyone in here say that the Civil War was not important to who you are today or society we has today, or we, that we have today? It is very important. Uh, the Bill of Rights, our Constitution, those predate us. But that is part of a context that comes in and continues to influence us every day. All right? It is part of our history. It is part of our context. Similarly, and I mentioned this early today, well, once we're dead, so what? Well, legacy comes in here. How do we want to be remembered? And even then, here I am now, but what about this? I live for my dreams. I live for my goals. I make plans. I make decisions and change decisions too. But that affects who I am. And it will also affect the context around me. I did make a decision to go to college against my will, but I still made that decision. All right. I should have been something else and I won't share that with you. Should I? Sure, yeah. Okay, I went to a career counselor. You sure? I went to a career counselor, and the career counselor gave me this test because I said I needed to talk to a career counselor about this, this survey thing. So they gave me this, this test, and I filled it out. And the counselor came in and sat down and said, um, It's okay not to be in college. It's okay. My number one career should have been a vending machine technician. <laughs> I kid you not, number two was an auto mechanic, number three was a carpenter, number four was a convenience store clerk. <laughs> and I was taken aback by this. Like, well, I don't know if my chairperson is gonna like this. <laughs> and the counselor said again, no, 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 they're very understanding. College is not for everybody. 
And I said, well, I'm already a tenured professor. <laughs> and I only came in here to find out what you're telling the students who I'm advising so we can kind of work together. Well, she was kind of upset at me in the beginning. Uh, but it also goes to show, you know, where things like that and basic serendipity can really lead you. I guess the moral of the story, I should never even be here today. Anyway, that's the future. And we do live for our future, too. I mean, who do donated the money for this building, the other new buildings? I tell my students to send the program that I'm director of $1.5 million, and I'll name an office after them so that they can be remembered after their death. And that will, if they decide to do it, will change their trajectory in life. Now, this is life course. Big difference from life span. I define it as lifespan in full context, full context, with critical treatment of time as I just introduced, all right? Now, speaking of context, and this is just logical sorts of things too, to complicate it, here is our person right here, characterized by these endogenous factors, and these are things that come from within, genetic controls, our personality, our inherent personality, the physiology that we have and level of function of all systems in our body, that comes from within. But this is within a family unit, which is in a community, which is in broader society. And all of these things are interacting. So there's all these arrows going back and forth. It's a classic textbook kind of picture. Then we put that in the context of all these other influential factors out here, which is just several examples, that's all. All right? So we're complicating things here, right? So if I want to decide to be a faculty member as opposed to a vending machine technician, there are family influences, and my family encourages me based on how it's going to look in the community, and that's going to influence them. And society is saying these days, well, we need to go to college because that's the only way to get ahead. And of course, I go to a particular college based on certain media, marketing, and advertisement, where tuition is lowest and they have the best student center that looks like a shopping mall or an airport. I had to say that too. All these things will influence those, right? So we're complicating it. And all these things vary across time and space, which makes it even more complicated. So uh, we're describing that person, me, each one of you. Now comes the idea of linked lives. You influence each other. We all influence each other. So we have all this complexity going on, and then you bump into someone else. Now that complexity is just adding to the complexity of someone else. That's the notion of linked lives, right? So we've just multiplied that times the number of people in our social network. Moderated, at least, by the priority of interactions within that social network. We're just leading the complexity on right here, okay? And all those arrows continue to be in these. I'm just making a case for complexity. Now we bring in the only quotes I'm going to use. Aging is basically the buildup of error. Dr. Michio Kaku said this. He's a theoretical physicist out of Chicago. but I'm a vending machine technician talking about aging. Aging is mostly the failure to repair. Gregory Benford, he's a science fiction author, but he's also on the faculty at University of California in astrophysics. So he's not a total moron, I suppose. Aging is not uncomplicated. I like this one in the use of double negatives. Ingmar Bergman, Swedish director, movie producer. That's what's happening here. Errors, our ability to fix errors. 
Or instead of using errors, we can say stresses on the system, challenges to the system. And how do we address those challenges? How do we adjust to those challenges? How do we repair damages because of those challenges? These are classic ways of thinking at a genetic level. Dr. Kaku, for example, when he was speaking of this, he was talking about the accumulation of genetic mutations where they continue to occur throughout life, naturally, naturally, all right? And I had mentioned earlier today that they figure, I don't know how, at birth, as soon as we have conception, there are immediately at least 18,000 random mutations in our genetic structure. 18,000 random mutations. Yet the fetus continues to develop and to develop normally these days in most cases. Because cells have this ability, and even the genes themselves, the DNA, has the ability to correct itself. It repairs itself. These mechanisms are built right into cellular function. So that ability to repair is very important. That's where he was coming from. But these stresses, these challenges, these errors can come from any sources. And that's my step in this way of thinking, too, that we can take these same ideas that really in system complexity starts out in theoretical physics, and it works in body systems and body environment interactions and social systems. That's where we're going with this argument. Are there any questions so far? Okay. I really would be preferring to move all over the place, but I'm trying not to. Okay. Kind of basic systems approach. And this, a notion of equilibrium. So in any system, the system itself is self-regulating, theoretically. So that when there's a disturbance in the system, there are mechanisms that kick in, basically, to adjust the system so it goes back to equilibrium. That's a real kind of thumbnail sketch of basic systems, all right, and a process of systems. So that we can achieve a state of homeostasis. Now in many therapeutic sciences, I've seen this in physical therapy, even occupational therapy, certainly I've seen it in the bench sciences, neurosciences, where they really talk about this, this notion of homeostasis and our ability to maintain some sort of equilibrium, even in our recovery from brain damage, even traumatic brain injury, trying to achieve this level of homeostasis. My argument is in an aging human organism that there is normative decline in function so that's a basic premise right there. And we can see that if we just look at any older person. And when I say that, you can be 20 years old, look at someone who's 40, they're older. Or if you want to, send yourself back to being a freshman in high school, the older person is the senior in high school. That's an older person. And you can recognize changes changes in the way they can function in life, all right? So really what's happening, we don't have a straight line going straight across. That would be equilibrium. But really, we have a dynamic equilibrium. There's a new target every year that we age chronologically. So that when our system is adjusting, it's got a different target and more important, and more descriptive of a curving line like this, we've got less and less capacity to fix ourselves. We just do. And I think we all have recognized stories where when we're young, we can be physically active all day, crash at night, wake up and still feel pretty good. Then you get into your 40s and 50s, and it's the day after Thanksgiving, and you are so sore because you were so active the day before, we can't recover as quickly. 
We can see this naturally too, just in physical stature, the fact that older people shrink. Now, it's not like the bones shrink, but the vertebrae are getting closer and closer together. There are discs between them, and they're, they're squishy. It's almost like pudding encased in cartilage. When we sleep, because of its resilience, it pooches back up so we're nice and tall. Measure yourselves in the morning. Just before going to bed, measure yourselves, and you're a little bit shorter. Wake up in the morning and you've grown again. So we're constantly doing that throughout the day. The older we get, the less we grow when we're sleeping, just from recovery of those discs. Case in point, my father was six feet tall. I'm 5'10". My father is now 93 years old, and he comes up to here on me. His discs have stopped recovering. He has lost that functional ability. And that's a physi part of his physiological reserve, all right? We don't heal as quickly. The endocrine system is not activate, activated nearly as much. Our immune system is not nearly as responsive to threats from the outside. Normative functional decline, that just happens. And that's all part of our reserve, the gas tank that we've got to fuel our recovery from any kind of stasis, uh, stresses. All right. Now, we get to the complicating part. And I'm gonna draw the line and how complicated I get. Let's get all the lines in here. And this is only a partial example. What I call heterodynamics. Now we can view this as a full complicated system, and that's what most people do. But that's rather naive. Because our different pieces and parts of our bodies are all aging at different paces functionally and physiologically or biologically, right? So my nervous system could be fully intact from now all the way through age 90. Circulatory system, well, I do love a good potato chip. And that's gonna influence it, right? Maybe I have not had good calcium or the use of calcium the uptake of calcium is not quite as efficient as it should be. So my bones are not as dense as they should be. So I'm more likely to be breaking a bone. Development of my musculature. These are all different systems and they're all aging at slightly or sometimes very different paces. But they're all an interacting whole, right? So even though these all look the same, Imagine them with different shaped lines and with this dashed line in here, which is our reserve for every single system, that being at a different level and a different rate of decline. Yet these systems are interacting. Now the interaction of those systems is what allows us to recover. It's a compensation. It's a stress response, stress response. Classic one in aging is oxidative stress. Naturally within the cell, a byproduct of metabolism is superoxides, like hydrogen peroxide being released in our cell. And that's pretty nasty stuff. But our cells actually manufacture antioxidants to neutralize those things. And then they're cleared from the cell. Typical waste clearance. So we can take care of that that function declines later in life. Metabolism is not as efficient, so we see an excess of oxidative species, reactive oxidative species. And again, the stuff is damaging. It damages the organelles within the cell. It damages the cell wall itself. It can cause mutations in the genetic structure. In some, it reduces the ability of the cell just to function. Classic example of stress response. Well, in this case, let's look at falls, all right? There's a lot of systems that are part of our ability to stand upright. We have a frame of bones. Muscles are hanging from those bones and attached to it so we can use them as levers, basically, 
All right. We have this vestibular system in our ears that allows us to maintain orientation in space, up and down, left and right, and to avoid throwing up when things get wacky. We have the nervous system in general, all right? And here I have central nervous system and specifically cognition. So when we're walking, we can avoid things that we can see. So there's sensory input as part of the nervous system as well too. And we can start thinking about what's going on and how to control. So that's part of it, all right? So we have sensory system. We have all these things that are happening just to keep us standing up. Let's stress the system. Break a bone. Well, we can start compensating for that. We can let the bone heal. But what if we injure a muscle or something like that? Well, then you start limping a little bit and you're compensating by use of other muscular systems. You have to be more aware in your sensory system so you don't fall. There are fine adjustments in the vestibular system too that allows us to remain upright. Or someone puts a chair in the way and we fall. Or we change the rugs in a house to make sure that we don't trip up on something that we may not see. But all these things are changing to allow us to stay upright. Still making sense? But we can mess around with any one of these systems. In a good functioning body, the other systems all kick in to keep us standing upright. With advanced age, though, we have less ability to do that. Interacting systems, all moving at their own pace of development, normatively, pathologically. I'm still kind of making a foundation for what comes next. Are we good so far? All right. Now for the paste E resistance. <laughs> Here's your stress. What are all the counties? Name them. No, I could not do that. Now, currently, I think there are 420 counties in Appalachia. When I first started doing work in Appalachia, there are 398. But you never know what Washington will do. One whole state, West Virginia, parts of 12 additional states. There's also eight independent cities that are in there too. All right, it is a political unit. I need to say that again, it's a political unit. It is not just based on a physical landscape. It is not. And that's important too, but it's a focus of a tremendous amount of research and some very, very good research, including a lot of work that is coming right out of this institution, this institution. It has also been called by many people a tremendous laboratory. And on, on one hand, I really hate saying that because people are not lab rats or anything like that. But it's such an amazing setting, a diverse setting, richly diverse setting. With the type of diversity and characteristics that you see nowhere else in the country. And it is comparable in some ways to other places in the world. International studies are ongoing. So there's our spatial context here, all right? Here's another context, per capita income. The darker the color, so the blues, lower the per capita income. I'm doing this for the geographers out there. So this is the way I love to interpret maps, kind of squint your eyes and look for patterns. And what immediately emerges is central Appalachia and some fringe areas in southern Appalachia, Mississippi and Alabama, all right? So that's telling us something. Fix that in your mind. So higher per capita incomes in the north basically too. All right, so step two, more context. Poverty rates. I think I've already described the pattern. Unemployment rates. And I think I've already described the pattern. Now we're still establishing a context in Appalachia. All right, so we see the central part of Appalachia emerging as having some issues. 
northern part of Appalachia, they seem to be okay so far. In the Atlanta area and oh, right through here, they're kind of doing okay. They get a lot of vacation travel through here and revenues from that. Then we have some more difficult counties down at the bottom. Seems to be repeating in everything. We can put these things together and we have what are called distressed counties. It really is a sum index of places that we need to pay attention to. And it is the accumulation of the three previous maps of income, poverty, unemployment. And using those measures, we can get an indication of where we have some big diversity within the region of Appalachia as a whole in really popping out central Appalachia. Okay? That's context. Let's stress the system. So we have this system. I've just set the context. We're going to stress it. Population changing. All right. We'll use that as an example of stress right now. Here, the more orange flavors and red flavors are areas with population decline. And this is based on most recent census characteristics, reliable data I would consider from 2010. All right. Blue areas are areas of growth. The richer the blue, the more rapid the growth. So we can see the Atlanta area, as an example, growing quite rapidly. But again, central Appalachia really popping out. Although, interestingly, the northern states are also losing population. This is our stress to the system. And we'll call it the social system within Appalachia. All right? Now, based on that, what kind of impacts can we have? All right, labor shortages of people moving away, it could be because of or it could result in declines in the tertiary economic sector. This is kind of value added goods. What really comes to mind is something like Fruit of the Loom underwear, which in eastern Kentucky is, was really big, employing a lot of people. And if they close up shop in a small county, that can be devastating, absolutely devastating. So we do have changes in that. It will affect the service sector. Now this includes everything from restaurants to banking, legal, health industries, and medical services. All those things can be affected because of that. Affected because the labor is not there, all right? or affected because the market is not there anymore. So we, it's great to have a store, but if no one's there to shop in it, we have some problems. Now notice this is overall population change. I'm not looking at older people in terms of this system disturbance, but the outcomes here can be pretty remarkable. Resource access to employment options, increasingly more individuals over the age of 65 continue to work because it is really the principal source of income. Not the exclusive source of income, but individuals can make more money continuing to work after the age of 65, 67 to 69 than they can from Social Security. Certainly from investments and certainly from pensions, all right? Declines in social activity, instrumental goods, those things we need to survive day to day. Nutrition, too, I'm going to focus on a little bit. If the grocery store doesn't have the market to stay open to close up shop, where do we get our salads? Where do we get our fresh vegetables? We don't. Unless we go to a convenience store attached to a gas station. And you're lucky to find them there. All right. Food deserts. Here's another big implication with population dynamics in here too. Now what this is looking at are areas with very poor access to nutritious food, nutritious food, where they have to travel at least 20 miles to get to something, or they do not have access to a vehicle, or a valid license to drive that vehicle, or they just can't drive it physically, all right? Under nutrition, they can't actually get to the food and they can't afford much of the food. 
Again, look right here in the central part of Appalachia if you squint your eyes. We're getting a lot of different systems that are working in here now, all right? Really, it's turning into the perfect storm. Malnutrition, this is not enough calories. This is just improper nutrients going into our system. Changing activity levels with advanced age, we can bring that in. Convenience eating, which means we get it from a convenience store, very poor nutrition generally, with the micronutrients that we need certainly. But also, uh, opening up a can of cat food is easier than making a three course meal. It is. And I've seen some of my research participants who really exist on pet food because it's cheaper and it's real easy to make. That's convenience eating. Sensory changes too, all right, our ability to taste food, all of that. And our guts change normatively as we age. We process food more slowly, uptake of nutrients really slows down. And that changes nutrition and our body chemistry. I'm keeping an eye on the time. And this is actually the final slide too. Diabetes and the future of aging. And I put this up there for several reasons. Because here again, this is a national map of diabetes. And the majority of all counties in the entire United States where their pathological levels of diagnosed diabetes are found really in this area, with this outline being Appalachia. Central Appalachia is a big part of it. And this is all ages, all ages. And this is big, this is really big. A big reason I think it's big is because nobody, and I mean nobody knows what will happen in later life to someone who has spent their entire life living with diabetes. Because up until just recently, people did not get type 2 diabetes until well into adulthood. But we're seeing the onset of diabetes now moving down into the mid-teens, low teens, with some cases being diagnosed at age 8, 9, and 10. And these individuals have been for a while now at the beginning phase of this, the growth of America, I might call it, uh, they've been living with that and the constant stress on the body, on the body systems. And that constant stress reduces reserve in the systems, our ability to self-adjust, if you will, to other outside stresses. So I'm hypothesizing, basically, the what lifelong diabetes and other health conditions are bringing to an aging America is a rapidly emptying gas tank, if you will, where we are losing our natural ability to compensate for stresses and challenges in our body, to self-repair all those errors that are accumulating within our body systems. What keeps us alive, what keeps our life expectancy high, the medical system. We go to the doctor. Pharmaceuticals keeping us alive. Central Appalachia, what is the access to those things? Especially when population is declining as rapidly as it is, when income levels are so low, poverty levels so high. So that very institution that has kept people alive, I would even say artificially the way it has, to allow our population to grow older is being diminished in Appalachia. At the same time, the physical systems of a person is being declined. And that basically is the bottom line and the moral of the story. That's the concluding chapter, I suppose, to what I'm talking about. I'm basically an optimist. But when it comes to something like this and everything I've read, and I'm doing research on nutrition and lifespan, life course nutrition right now, and it is just not a pretty picture, not a pretty picture. And placed in the context of Appalachia, it can be kind of frightening. This is a bad thing to say at almost 5 o'clock on a Friday, too. 
And I have no jokes to end it with. I apologize for that. But I will take some questions if you have any questions. We still have some time. Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much for um, sharing your experience with us this afternoon. Um, one of my concerns with gerontology is not really my area of research, but I focus mostly on caregiver stresses. Uh -huh. You know, when caregivers are carrying caregivers or family members caring for a loved one. I focus on um, end stage renal disease and, and, and obesity and diabetes are uh, front and center of kidney failure. Yeah. But that beg, I've been recently interested in learning about gerontology and as, as the population is aging. One of my findings in my research is nothing new, really. We, we do know that in the Appalachian region, a lot of rural hospitals have been closing. Yeah. Hospital closures. I wonder. You know, when, we, when you have such beautiful data you're from your own research as well as from the U.S. Census Bureau and all that, mm -hmm. we know these things are happening. Why, I'm just throwing this question at you, um, why are there not enough efforts to make sure that these hospitals which cater to the rural populations in Appalachia, sticking with this region, why are we letting this happen? Why are we why are we not doing enough? The yeah. government the legislation's not doing enough to make sure that these hospitals stay in business and continue providing health care to our rural populations. Yeah. <coughs> That's a really good point about the context in which we're talking in Appalachian too. And from a systems perspective on that too, I mean, first of all, what are the causes of that? There are federal causes, first of all, in Medicaid, Medicare system, and reimbursement levels, and how long it takes to get reimbursed for even some basic services, which is more of a stress on the local hospitals because they're living on a shoestring budget to start with. And the personnel of people who are actually working in those areas trying to recruit the appropriate service providers to work in there. So it's a, it's a very tough thing for the administrators of these hospitals, first of all. And this is becoming more and more widespread, and we certainly recognize it in the central part of Appalachia as well. Um, state level, too, is state level allocations of, of Medicaid dollars, all right? This, these are government issues. And what do we spend it on? Do we spend it on the hospitals that where an increasing, I don't know if I can say majority yet, but increasing share of those dollars are spent in maintaining an older population as opposed to putting it in schools where we already have kind of healthy children to promote education and then job opportunities. So it's those balancing acts. Now to, to increase that even more is that what it has done, and it probably is even coming out of Ohio University, where there is almost a felt obligation of the institutions to begin stepping in. I know at the University of Kentucky, I mean, we're right on the doorstep of eastern Kentucky, which is very impoverished. A lot of distressed counties there. There's a tremendous amount of outreach from our medical centers, health services, and health sciences, where they're setting up satellite clinics. They're setting up uh, mobile clinics, even, mobile clinics. Uh, dentistry out of the University of Kentucky has this beautiful mobile home and it's way huge, but that's their traveling clinic. And it is on the road almost all the time traveling through dominantly the eastern part of the state to try to get these services in there. Now that's the medical side too. In public health, we can start working on some preventative efforts. So we don't have the facilities there anymore, so what can we do to reduce the demand for those facilities? And it's it's, it's a scapegoat measure. That's all we can say. It's good for a general population that we view by squinting our eyes, but if we do focus on the realities of an aging population, we can't pretend they're not going to need it. Yeah. So even that is a very complex issue. When you play one little disturbance in there, and the entire system has to continually readjust it. In Kentucky, we got a new governor. That's all it takes, a couple votes. And you can't, well, I think you can imagine all the different adjustments to the system. And you know some of those adjustments occur inside the human body. People have to get used to new diets. 
because now all of a sudden they don't have the money to afford some of the food they had been accustomed to. So the regimen of metabolizing the food they eat is now changed. That's how weird I think, I suppose. But you're absolutely correct. I thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, that's part of the structure behind it all. Let's go back here. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, basic universal income and how that could affect aging? Basic universal income. I can only guess what that is, and it sounds sort of socialist. Yeah, I know it's Scandinavian, <laughs> no, it is. I know it's Scandinavian country doing it, but every citizen gets a monthly check from the government just for being a citizen. Ah, okay. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think more about it. I would, to try to understand what the implications are in a population, go directly to Alaska. Either travel there or look it up. Because as part of the oil revenues they have statewide, they have a universal allocation of some income that really brings up the income of everybody. My immediate thought on that would be a market adjustment. Cost of living would be ramped up at the same level. So what difference would it make? So that's something I'd want to think more about, though. Yeah, it's a real good question. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. My question would be, I guess, if we need to pick three most important reasons behind the very high number of uh, diabetes in this particular region in comparison to the other regions of the United States, what those th uh, three would be? So the factors that cause that map to happen. I'm not going to prioritize them, okay? Number one is education. And this is education really through high school. All right, I'm not going to talk about post-secondary education. Education would be number one. A second and very important one that is, I think, too often neglected or minimized is the influence of culture. If you take a look at this pattern right here, too, and you take a look at the racial mix, composition in these in these areas right here. You see much higher levels of blacks, of African Americans. And we know through a lot of research that in the sociology of food, food is part of tradition, it is part of socializing, it is part of social networks. And the origins of a lot of food in these areas too are frankly drawn from Africa, it's drawn from subsistence living, it has basis in some very cheap foods, which, you know, from a, a uh, marginalized population becomes very important in terms of getting the nutrition we need at a low cost. And that becomes part of tradition, frankly, part of tradition. So we balance this. We know that we should be eating better, but do we do that while sacrificing our culture? and the benefits that we get from the social interactions, right? Um, and as an example of that too, I'm from the upper Midwest. Church picnics, corn boils, basically, and it's when you're done with that, you eat more corn and you eat more corn. And when you're done with that for dessert, you have corn pudding, I suppose, I don't know. But down here, Part of one's religion is heavily connected with food, intimately connected with food, where these large gatherings of congregations are centered on the foods that individuals bring and their special recipes that are steeped in generations of tradition. And it's part of it. It is part of life. And it's a very tough decision to start sacrificing those things. And it is literally a sacrifice because it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to go to social gatherings like that and say no to a big plate of fried chicken. And that is not a joke. It is not. There's tremendous social pressure to be a part of the food. So it's not just that individual agency. All right. So culture is second. All right. And then we had education as number one, and I have to dream up a third one. I put that directly and squarely on income levels and accessibility. It just is. Income levels and accessibility. 
an increase in convenience eating. It's easy, so we do it. We saw that in the 1950s when TV dinners were invented. Yeah. And a big implication of the invention of the TV dinner is releasing time for women in women's roles. And from that point on, we saw an acceleration of women engaged in career employment. Not just jobs and working, but career employment. So I can't help but notice a lot of the trends that are happening on this map, where there are distressed counties and higher um, diabetic cases, is also where the opiate epidemic seems to have the strongest roots. Right. Um, I'm wondering, in your opinion, what does this crisis that we're currently facing, how does this affect our aging population? We don't know yet, totally. But here are some things that we do know is that older adults are implicated in part, not that they're at fault, but they are part of the problem when it comes to the prescription opiates. There's no question about that. Now, why would older people really do that? Because it's fun? No. Look at income levels, look at poverty levels, look at just natural reductions when we're separated from a paid labor force, right? In an area that's already impoverished economically, so if I can take a prescription of my medication that I really, really do need for pain management, and I can cut my dosage in half, I'm changing my self-medication, I can turn that into food. I mean, how can you almost not make the decision to do it? Because we're talking about basic survival here in many cases, basic survival. And then it's just a cascade of events. It's a cascade of events. Then we find, dare I say, younger population who is starting to take advantage of an older population, either voluntarily on the older person's part or involuntarily taking advantage of their access to opiate medications, opiate-based medications. So it is part of them. Now that's one side. The other side, and this is what we really don't know, is what the downstream implications of all this are going to be for an aging population and for populations in general. I do know anecdotally from some recent research I've been doing in Eastern Kentucky is that older adults there are leaving. They don't want to be part of that environment now with the opiate issue. They honestly are leaving. If they can, and it's a very difficult thing to leave. And what we're seeing, and it's almost replicating the migration, the great migration streams of 1970. They're moving from Eastern Kentucky to uh, Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis. Places where streams of Appalachian individuals moved during the 1970s when the bottom fell out of the coal industry, unemployment was really high, and they just were moving away for jobs. And older individuals were staying in eastern Kentucky. We saw dramatic increases in aging in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But now, eastern Kentucky is getting younger because the old people are either dying or they're getting out of Dodge. And I just discovered that about three, four months ago. And it's in more than six or seven or eight or nine counties, too. And it seems to be a trend now. They're taking advantage of established social networks outside the region. And it's gotten to a point where they're leaving. So, and in basic health, someone who has been using, assuming they're not dead from opiates, right, what is their ability to compensate for stresses, respond to stresses going to be in another 15, 20, 25 years? Not everybody can be like Keith Richards. Yeah, that's a big issue now. I thought about talking about that, but that really distresses me. It is really severe in Kentucky these days, really severe. Yeah, it is no longer 501. And I hope. Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for the talk. That was very informative. That's good. And uh, let's see. 
In the past few decades, this poverty studies has focused so much on the urban poor, right? The decline or their job market yeah. or suburbanization, deindustrialization, all that. But then in the past few years, uh, all of a sudden, this academic attention has shifted to the rural poor. So I was wondering whether that's just kind of trendy thing to do to do research on rural poverty or their, or their problem just has gotten more serious because they are aging they're, they, or yeah. other health issues or service issues. So. That's a really good, it's, it's a good observation. It's a very good observation. Um, I, my own thinking is that it's more of a trend in research and re research emphases. Because uh, you're absolutely right, even, even in geography in general, there was the urban focus for quite a while in terms of income differentials, poverty, poverty pockets, and even food deserts within urban areas. All based on the accessibility, and in terms of an older population, we can't assume that an older, older person li <coughs> living in a high-rise subsidized residence near an urban center has access to access to health care and services, the support that they need, the caregiving that they need, all right, the nutrition that they need, and maintain a sense of security in their living environment. We can't assume that. And research has demonstrated that we're right, we can't assume it. But I think it was a trend. Why it's actually moved to rural areas I don't know. I haven't thought that much about it. I would have to point my fingers east towards Washington and the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, I think. And it's come full circle. And I think we've seen that even in demographic research. It was the urban word movement. Then it was the counter movement towards rural areas and rural development. Then it went back to the cities. Now it's going back to, <laughs> to rural areas, isn't it? I don't know. I, that's a great observation. I've got to look at the roots of that. But it's absolutely spot on. Other ones, should we call it quits? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for coming.